Chapter 29 Eyes Without Pity Elias pushed for speed across the brown grass flatland, as if trying to make up for the time spent with the traveling people, setting a pace southward that had even Bella grateful to stop when twilight deepened. Despite his desire for haste, though, he took precautions he had not taken before. At night they had a fire only if there was dead wood already on the ground. He would not let them break so much as a twig off of a standing tree. The fires he made were small and always hidden in a pit carefully dug where he had cut away a plug of sod. As soon as their meal was prepared, he buried the coals and replaced the plug. Before they set out again in the gray false dawn, he went over the campsite inch by inch to make sure there was no sign that anyone had ever been there. He even righted overturned rocks and straightened bent-down weeds. He did it quickly, never taking more than a few minutes, but they did not leave until he was satisfied. Pear did not think the precautions were much good against dreams, but when he began to think of what they might be good against, he wished it were only the dreams. The first time, Egwene asked anxiously if the Trollocs were back, but Elias only shook his head and urged them on. Perrin said nothing. He knew there were no Trollocs close. The wolves scented only grass and trees and small animals. It was not fear of Trollocs that drove Elias, but something else, of which even Elias was not sure. The wolves knew nothing of what it was, but they sensed Elias's urgent wariness, and they began to scout as if danger ran at their heels or waited in ambush over the next rise. The land became long rolling crests, too low to be called hills, rising across their path. A carpet of tough grass, still winter sear and dotted with rank weeds, spread before them, rippled by an east wind that had nothing to cut it for a hundred miles. The groves of trees grew more scattered. The sun rose reluctantly, without warmth. Among the squat ridges, Elias followed the contours of the land as much as possible, and he avoided topping the rises whenever possible. He seldom talked, and when he did... You know how long this is taking, going around every bloody little hill like this? Blood and ashes! I'll be till summer getting you off my hands. No, we can't just go in a straight line. How many times do I have to tell you? You have any idea, even the faintest, how a man stands out on a ridge line in country like this? Burn me, but we're going back and forth as much as forward, wiggling like a snake. I could move faster with my feet tied. Were you going to stare at me, or were you going to walk? Perrin exchanged glances with Egwene. She stuck her tongue out at Elias's back. Neither of them said anything. The one time Egwene had protested that Elias was the one who wanted to go around the hills, and he should not blame them, it got her a lecture on how sound carried, delivered in a growl that could have been heard a mile off. He gave the lecture over his shoulder, and he never even slowed to give it. Whether he was talking or not, Elias's eyes searched all around them, sometimes staring as if there were something to see except the same coarse grass that was under their feet. If he did see anything, Perrin could not, and neither could the wolves. Elias's forehead grew extra furrows, but he would not explain. Not why they had to hurry, not what he was afraid was hunting them. Sometimes a longer ridge than usual lay across their path, stretching miles and miles to east and west. Even Elias had to agree that going around those would take them too far out of their way. He did not let them simply cross over, though. Leaving them at the base of the slope, he would creep up to the crest on his belly, peering over as cautiously as though the wolves had not scouted there ten minutes before. Waiting at the bottom of the ridge, minutes passed like hours, and the not knowing pressed on them. Egwene chewed her lip and unconsciously clicked the beads Aram had given her through her fingers. Perrin waited doggedly his stomach twisted up in a sick knot. But he managed to keep his face calm, managed to keep the turmoil hidden inside. The wolves will warn if there's danger. It would be wonderful if they went away, if they just vanished, but right now... Right now they'll give warning. What is he looking for? What? After a long search, with only his eyes above the rise, Elias always motioned them to come ahead. Every time the way ahead was clear until the next time they found a ridge they could not go around. At the third such ridge, Perrin's stomach lurched. Sour fumes rose in his throat, and he knew if he had to wait even five minutes, he would vomit. I... he swallowed. I'm coming too. Keep low, was all Elias said. As soon as he spoke, Egwene jumped down from Bella. The fur-clad man pushed his round hat forward and peered at her from under the edge. 
You expecting to make that mare crawl? He said dryly. Her mouth worked, but no sound came out. Finally, she shrugged, and Elias turned away without another word and began climbing the easy slope. Perrin hurried after him. Well short of the crest, Elias made a downward motion, and a moment later flattened himself on the ground, wriggling forward the last few yards. Perrin flopped on his belly. At the top, Elias took off his hat before raising his head ever so slowly. Peering through a clump of thorny weeds, Perrin saw only the same rolling plain that lay behind them. The downslope was bare, though a clump of trees a hundred paces across grew in the hollow, perhaps half a mile south from the ridge. The wolves had already been through it, smelling no trace of Trollocs or Murdral. East and west, the land was the same as far as Perrin could see, rolling grassland and wide-scattered thickets. Nothing moved. The wolves were more than a mile ahead, out of sight. At that distance, he could barely feel them. They had seen nothing when they covered this ground. What is he looking for? There's nothing there. We're wasting time, he said, starting to stand, and a flock of ravens burst out of the trees below, fifty, a hundred blackbirds spiraling into the sky. He froze in a crouch as they milled over the trees. The dark one's eyes, did they see me? Sweat trickled down his face. As if one thought had suddenly sparked in a hundred tiny minds, every raven broke sharply in the same direction south. The flock disappeared over the next rise, already descending. To the east, another thicket disgorged more ravens. The black mass wheeled twice and headed south. Shaking, he lowered himself to the ground slowly. He tried to speak, but his mouth was too dry. After a minute, he managed to work up some spit. Was that what you were afraid of? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't the wolves see them? Wolves don't look up in trees much, Elias growled. And no, I wasn't looking for this. I told you I didn't know what. Far to the west, a black cloud rose over yet another grove and winged southward. They were too far off to make out individual birds. It isn't a big hunt, thank the light. They don't know. Even after... He turned to stare back the way they had come. Perrin swallowed even after the dream Elias had meant. Not big, he said. Back home you won't see that many ravens in a whole year. Elias shook his head. In the borderlands I've seen sweeps with a thousand ravens to the flock. Not too often. There's still a bounty on ravens there, but it has happened. He was still looking north. Hush now. Perrin felt it then, the effort of reaching out to the distant wolves. Elias wanted Dapple and her companions to quit scouting ahead, to hurry back and check their back trail. His already gaunt face tightened and thinned under the strain. The wolves were so far away, Perrin could not even feel them. Hurry, watch the sky, hurry. Faintly, Perrin caught the reply from far to the south. We come. An image flashed in his mind. Wolves running, muzzles pointing into the wind of their haste, running as if wildfire raced behind running, flashed, and was gone in an instant. Elias slumped and drew a deep breath. Frowning, he peered over the ridge, then back to the north and muttered under his breath. You think there are more ravens behind us? Perrin asked. Could be, Elias said vaguely. They do it that way sometimes. I know a place, if we can reach it by dark. We have to keep moving until full dark anyway, even if we don't get there. But we can't go as fast as I would like. Can't afford to get too close to the ravens ahead of us. But if they're behind us, too... Why dark? Perrin said. What place? Somewhere safe from the ravens? Safe from ravens, Elias said. But too many people know... Ravens roost for the night. We don't have to worry about them finding us in the dark. The lights and ravens are all we have to worry about then. With one more look over the crest, he rose and waved to Egwene to bring Bella up. But dark is a long way off. We have to get moving. He started down the far slope in a shambling run, each stride barely catching him on the edge of falling. Move, burn you! Perrin moved, half running, half sliding after him. Egwene topped the rise behind them, kicking Bella to a trot. A grin of relief bloomed on her face when she saw them. 
What's going on? She called, urging the shaggy mare to catch up. When you disappeared like that, I thought... What happened? Perrin saved his breath for running until she reached them. He explained about the ravens and Elias's safe place, but it was a disjointed story. After a strangled, Ravens! She kept interrupting with questions for which, as often as not, he had no answers. Between them, he did not finish until they reached the next ridge. Ordinarily, if anything about the journey could be called ordinary, they would have gone around this one rather than over, but Elias insisted on scouting anyway. You want to just saunter right into the middle of them, boy? was his sour comment. Egwene stared at the crest of the ridge, licking her lips, as if she wanted to go with Elias this time, and wanted to stay where she was, too. Elias was the only one who showed no hesitation. Perrin wondered if the ravens ever doubled back. It would be a fine thing to reach the crest at the same time as a flock of ravens. At the top, he inched his head up until he could just see, and heaved a sigh of relief when all he saw was a copse of trees a little to the west. There were no ravens to be seen. Abruptly, a fox burst out of the trees, running hard. Ravens poured from the branches after it. The beat of their wings almost drowned out a desperate whining from the fox. A black whirlwind dove and swirled around it. The fox's jaws snapped at them, but they darted in and darted away untouched, black beaks glistening wetly. The fox turned back toward the trees, seeking the safety of its den. It ran awkwardly now, head low, fur dark and bloody, and the ravens flapped around it, more and more of them at once, the fluttering mass thickening until it hid the fox completely. As suddenly as they had descended, the ravens rose, wheeled, and vanished over the next rise to the south. A misshapen lump of torn fur marked what had been the fox. Perrin swallowed hard. Light. They could do that to us. A hundred ravens. They could... Move, Elias growled, jumping up. He waved to Egwene to come on, and without waiting, set off at a trot toward the trees. Move, burn you, he called over his shoulder. Move! Egwene galloped Bella over the rise and caught them before they reached the bottom of the slope. There was no time for explanations, but her eyes picked out the fox right away. Her face went as white as snow. Elias reached the trees and turned there, at the edge of the copse, waving vigorously for them to hurry. Perrin tried to run faster and stumbled. Arms windmilling, he barely caught himself short of going flat on his face. Blood and ashes, I'm running as fast as I can. A lone raven winged out of the copse. It tilted toward them, screamed, and spun toward the south. Knowing he was already too late, Perrin fumbled his sling from around his waist. He was still trying to get a stone from his pocket to the sling when the raven abruptly folded up in midair and plummeted to the ground. His mouth dropped open, and then he saw the sling hanging from Egwene's hand. She grinned at him unsteadily. Don't stand there counting your toes, Elias called. With a start, Perrin hurried into the trees, then jumped out of the way to avoid being trampled by Egwene and Bella. Far to the west, almost out of sight, what seemed like a dark mist rose into the air. Perrin felt the wolves passing in that direction, heading north. He felt them notice ravens to the left and right of them, without slowing. The dark mist swirled northward as if pursuing the wolves, then abruptly broke off and flashed to the south. Do you think they saw us? Egwene asked. We were already in the trees, weren't we? They couldn't see us at that distance, could they? Not that far off. We saw them at that distance, Elias said dryly. Perrin shifted uneasily and Egwene drew a frightened breath. If they had seen us, Elias growled, they'd have been down on us like they were on that fox. Think if you want to stay alive. Fear will kill you if you don't control it. His penetrating stare held on each of them for a moment. Finally, he nodded. They're gone now, and we should be too. Keep those slings handy. Might be useful again. As they moved out of the copse, Elias angled them westward from the line of march they had been following. Perrin's breath snagged in his throat. It was as if they were chasing after the last ravens they had seen. Elias kept on tirelessly, and there was nothing for them to do but follow. After all, Elias knew a safe place. Somewhere, so he said. They ran to the next hill, waited till the ravens moved on, then ran again, waited, ran. 
The steady progress they had been keeping had been tiring enough, but all except Elias quickly began to flag under this jerky pace. Perrin's chest heaved and he gulped air when he had a few minutes to lie on a hilltop, leaving the search to Elias. Bella stood head down, nostrils flaring at every stop. Fear lashed them on and Perrin did not know if it was controlled or not. He only wished the wolves would tell them what was behind them, if anything was, whatever it was. Ahead there were more ravens than Perrin ever hoped to see again. To the left and right, the blackbirds billowed up and to the south. A dozen times they reached the hiding place of a grove or the scant shelter of a slope only moments before ravens swept into the sky. Once, with the sun beginning to slide from its midday height, they stood in the open, frozen as still as statues, half a mile from the nearest cover, while a hundred of the Dark One's feathered spies flashed by a bare mile to the east. Sweat rolled down Perrin's face despite the wind, until the last black shape dwindled to a dot and vanished. He lost count of the stragglers they brought down with their slings. He saw more than enough evidence lying in the path the ravens had covered to justify his fear. He had stared with a queasy fascination at a rabbit that had been torn to pieces. The eyeless head stood upright, with the other bits, legs, entrails, scattered in a rough circle around it. Birds, too, stabbed to shapeless masses of feathers, and two more foxes. He remembered something Lan had said. All the Dark One's creatures delight in killing. The Dark One's power is death, and if the ravens found them... Pitiless eyes shining like black beads, stabbing beaks swirling around them. Needle-sharp beaks drawing blood, a hundred of them. Or can they call more of their kind? Maybe all of them in the hunt. A sickening image built up in his mind. A pile of ravens as big as a hill, seething like maggots, fighting over a few bloody shreds. Suddenly the image was swept away by others, each one clear for an instant, then spinning and fading into another. The wolves had found ravens to the north. Screaming birds dove and whirled and dove again, beaks drawing blood with every swoop. Snarling wolves dodged and leaped, twisting in the air, jaws snapping. Again and again, Perrin tasted feathers and the foul taste of fluttering ravens crushed alive, felt the pain of oozing gashes all over his body. Knew with a despair that never touched on giving up that all his effort was not enough. Suddenly the ravens broke away, wheeling overhead for one last shriek of rage at the wolves. Wolves did not die as easily as foxes, and they had a mission. A flap of black wings, and they were gone, a few black feathers drifting down on their dead. Wind licked at a puncture on his left foreleg. There was something wrong with one of Hopper's eyes. Ignoring her own hurts, Dapple gathered them, and they settled into a painful lope in the direction the ravens had gone. Blood matted their fur. We come. Danger comes before us. Moving in a stumbling trot, Perrin exchanged a glance with Elias. The man's yellow eyes were expressionless, but he knew. He said nothing, just watched Perrin and waited, all the while maintaining that effortless lope. Waiting for me. Waiting for me to admit I feel the wolves. Ravens, Perrin panted reluctantly. Behind us. He was right, Egwene breathed. You can talk to them. Perrin's feet felt like lumps of iron on the ends of wooden posts, but he tried to make them move faster. If he could but outrun their eyes, outrun the ravens, outrun the wolves, but above all, Egwene's eyes, that knew him now for what he was. What are you? Tainted? The light blind me. Cursed. His throat burned, as it never had from breathing the smoke and heat of Master Luhan's forge. He staggered and hung on to Egwene's stirrup until she climbed down and all but pushed him into the saddle despite his protests that he could keep going. It was not long, though, before she was clutching the stirrup as she ran, holding up her skirts with the other hand, and only a little while after that, until he dismounted, his knees still wobbling. He had to pick her up to make her take his place, but she was too tired to fight him. Elias would not slow down. He urged them and taunted them and kept them so close behind the searching ravens to the south that Perrin thought all it would take would be for one bird to look back. Keep moving, burn you. Think you'll do any better than that fox did if they catch us? The one with its insides piled on its head? 
Egwene swayed out of the saddle and vomited noisily. I knew you'd remember. Just keep moving a little more. That's all. Just a little more. Burn you, I thought farm youngsters had endurance. Work all day and dance all night. Sleep all day and sleep all night, looks like to me. Move your bloody feet! They began coming down off the hills as soon as the last raven vanished over the next one. Then while the last trailers still flapped above the hilltop. One bird looking back. To east and west the ravens searched while they hurried across the open spaces between them. One bird is all it will take. The ravens behind were coming fast. Dapple and the other wolves worked their way around them and were coming on without stopping to lick their wounds. But they had learned all the lessons they needed about watching the sky. How close, how long. The wolves had no notions of time the way men did, no reasons to divide a day into hours. The seasons were time enough for them, and the light and the dark. No need for more. Finally, Perrin worked out an image of where the sun would stand in the sky when the ravens overran them from behind. He glanced over his shoulder at the setting sun and licked his lips with a dry tongue. In an hour, the ravens would be on them, maybe less. An hour. And it was a good two hours to sunset. At least two to full dark. We'll die with the setting sun, he thought, staggering as he ran, slaughtered like the fox. He fingered his axe, then moved to his sling. That would be more use. Not enough, though. Not against a hundred ravens, a hundred darting targets, a hundred stabbing beaks. It's your turn to ride, Perrin, Egwene said tiredly. In a bit, he panted. I'm good for miles yet. She nodded and stayed in the saddle. She is tired. Tell her, or let her think we still have a chance to escape. An hour of hope, even if it is desperate, or an hour of despair. Elias was watching him again, saying nothing. He must know, but he did not speak. Perrin looked at Egwene again and blinked away hot tears. He touched his axe and wondered if he had the courage. In the last minutes when the ravens descended on them, when all hope was gone, would he have the courage to spare her the death the fox had died? Light make me strong. The ravens ahead of them suddenly seemed to vanish. Perrin could still make out dark, misty clouds far to the east and west, but ahead, nothing. Where did they go? Light if we've overrun them. Abruptly, a chill ran through him. One cold, clean tingle, as if he had jumped into the wine spring water in midwinter. It rippled through him and seemed to carry away some of the fatigue, a little of the ache in his legs and the burning of his lungs. It left behind... something. He could not say what, only he felt different. He stumbled to a halt and looked around, afraid. Elias watched him, watched them all, with a gleam behind his eyes. He knew what it was, Perrin was sure of it, but he only watched them. Egwene reined in Bella and looked around uncertainly, half wondering and half fearful. It's strange, she whispered. I feel as if I lost something. Even the mare had her head up expectantly, nostrils flaring as if they detected a faint odor of new-mown hay. What... What was that? Perrin asked. Elias cackled suddenly. He bent over, shoulders shaking, to rest his hands on his knees. Safety, that's what. We made it, you bloody fools. No raven will cross that line. Not one that carries the dark one's eyes anyways. A trollic would have to be driven across, and there'd need to be something fierce pushing the murder roll to make him do the driving. No eyes to die, either. The one power won't work here. They can't touch the true source. Can't even feel the source, like it vanished. Makes them itch inside, that does. Gives them the shakes like a seven-day drunk. It's safety. At first, to Perrin's eyes, the land was unchanged from the rolling hills and ridges they had crossed the whole day. Then he noticed green shoots among the grass. Not many, and they were struggling, but more than he had seen anywhere else. There were fewer weeds in the grass, too. He could not imagine what it was, but there was something about this place. And something in what Elias said tickled his memory. What is it? Egwene asked. 
I feel... What is this place? I don't think I like it. A stirring, Elias roared. You never listen to stories? Of course, there hasn't been an Ogier here in 3,000 odd years, not since the breaking of the world. But it's the steading makes the Ogier, not the Ogier makes the steading. Just a legend, Perrin stammered. In the stories, the steading were always havens, places to hide, whether it was from Aes Sedai or from creatures of the Father of Lies. Elias straightened. If not exactly fresh, he gave no sign that he had spent most of a day running. Come on. We'd better get deeper into this legend. The ravens can't follow, but they can still see us this close to the edge. And there could be enough of them to watch the whole border of it. Let them keep hunting right on by it. Perrin wanted to stay right there, now that he was stopped. His legs trembled and told him to lie down for a week. Whatever refreshment he had felt had been momentary. All the weariness and aches were back. He forced himself to take one step, then another. It did not get easier, but he kept at it. Egwene flapped the reins to get Bella moving again. Elias settled into an effortless lope, only slowing to a walk when it became apparent the others could not keep up. A fast walk. Why don't we stay here, Perrin panted. He was breathing through his mouth, and he forced the words out between deep, racking breaths. If it's really a steading, we'd be safe. No Trollocs, no Aes Sedai. Why don't we just stay here until it's all over? Maybe the wolves won't come here either. How long will that be? Elias looked over his shoulder with one eyebrow raised. What would you eat? Grass, like the horse? Besides, there's others know about this place, and nothing keeps men out, not even the worst of them. And there is only one place where there's still water to be found. Frowning uneasily, he turned in a complete circle, scanning the land. When he was done, he shook his head and muttered to himself. Perrin felt him calling to the wolves. Hurry, hurry. We take our chances on a choice of evils, and the ravens are sure. Come on, it's only another mile or two. Perrin would have groaned if he had been willing to spare the breath. Huge boulders began to dot the low hills, irregular lumps of gray, lichen-coated stone half buried in the ground, some as big as a house. Brambles webbed them, and low brush half hid most. Here and there, amid the desiccated brown of brambles and brush, a lone green shoot announced that this was a special place. Whatever wounded the land beyond its borders hurt it, too, but here the wound did not go quite as deep. Eventually they straggled over one more rise, and at the base of this hill lay a pool of water. Any of them could have waded across it in two strides, but it was clear and clean enough to show the sandy bottom like a sheet of glass. Even Elias hurried eagerly down the slope. Perrin threw himself full length in the ground when he reached the pool and plunged his head in. An instant later he was spluttering from the cold of water that had welled up from the depths of the earth. He shook his head, his long hair spraying a rain of drops. Egwene grinned and splashed back at him. Perrin's eyes grew sober. She frowned and opened her mouth, but he stuck his face back in the water. No questions, not now. No explanations, not ever. But a small voice taunted him. But you would have done it, wouldn't you? Eventually Elias called him away from the pool. Anybody wants to eat? I want some help. Egwene worked cheerfully, laughing and joking as they prepared their scanty meal. There was nothing left but cheese and dried meat. There had been no chance to hunt. At least there was still tea. Perrin did his share, but silently. He felt Egwene's eyes on him, saw a growing worry on her face, but he avoided meeting her eyes as much as he could. Her laughter faded, and the jokes came further apart, each one more strained than the last. Elias watched, saying nothing. A somber mood descended, and they began their meal in silence. The sun grew red in the west, and their shadows stretched out long and thin. Not quite an hour till dark. If not for the steading, all of you would be dead now. Would you have saved her? Would you have cut her down like so many bushes? Bushes don't bleed, do they? Or scream, and look in your eyes and ask why. Baron drew in on himself more. 
He could feel something laughing at him, deep in the back of his mind, something cruel. Not the dark one, he almost wished it was. Not the dark one, himself. For once Elias had broken his rule about fires. There were no trees, but he snapped dead branches from the brush and built his fire against a huge chunk of rock sticking out of the hillside. From the layers of soot staining the stone, Perrin thought the site must have been used by generation after generation of travelers. What showed above ground of the big rock was rounded somewhat, with a sharp break on one side where moss, old and brown, covered the ragged surface. The grooves and hollows eroded in the rounded part looked odd to Perrin, but he was too absorbed in gloom to wonder about it. Egwene, though, studied it as she ate. That, she said finally, looks like an eye. Perrin blinked. It did look like an eye, under all that soot. It is, Elias said. He sat with his back to the fire and the rock, studying the land around them while he chewed on a strip of dried meat almost as tough as leather. Arter Hawkwing's eye, the eye of the High King himself. This is what his power and glory came to in the end. He said it absently. Even his chewing was absent-minded. His eyes and his attention were on the hills. Arthur Hawkwing, Egwene exclaimed. You're choking with me. It isn't an eye at all. Why would somebody carve Arthur Hawkwing's eye on a rock out here? Elias glanced over his shoulder at her, muttering. What do they teach you, village whelps? He snorted and straightened back to his watching, but he went on talking. Arthur Pendrag Tanriol. Arthur Hawkwing, the High King, united all the lands from the Great Blight to the Sea of Storms, from the Arth Ocean to the Aeel Waste, and even some beyond the Waste. He even sent armies the other side of the Arth Ocean. The stories say he ruled the whole world, but what he really did rule was enough for any man outside of his story, and he brought peace and justice to the land. All stood equal before the law, Egwene said, and no man raised his hand against another. So you've heard the stories, at least, Elias chuckled, a dry sound. Arthur Hawkwing brought peace and justice, but he did it with fire and sword. A child could ride alone with a bag of gold from the Arth Ocean to the spine of the world and never have a moment's fear. But the High King's justice was as hard as that rock there for anyone who challenged his power, even if it was just by being who they were, or by people thinking they were a challenge. The common folk had peace and justice and full bellies. But he laid a twenty-year siege to Tarvalin and put a price of a thousand gold crowns on the head of every Aes Sedai. I thought you didn't like Aes Sedai, Egwene said. Elias gave a wry smile. Doesn't matter what I like, girl. Arthur Hawkwing was a proud fool. An Aes Sedai healer could have saved him when he took sick or was poisoned, as some say. But every eye said I still alive was penned up behind the shining walls, using all their power to hold off an army that lit up the night with their campfires. He wouldn't have let one near him anyway. He hated I said I as much as he hated the Dark One. Egwene's mouth tightened, but when she spoke, all she said was, What does that have to do with whether that's Archer Hawkwing's eye? Just this, girl. With peace, except for what was going on across the ocean, with the people cheering him wherever he went, they really loved him, you see. He was a harsh man, but never with the common folk. Well, with all of that, he decided it was time to build himself a capital. A new city, not connected in any man's mind with any old cause or faction or rivalry. Here, he'd build it, at the very center of the land bordered by the seas and the waste and the blight. Here, where no Aes Sedai would ever come willing, or could use the power if they did. A capital from which one day the whole world would receive peace and justice. When they heard the proclamation, the common people subscribed enough money to build a monument to him. Most of them looked on him as only a step below the Creator. A short step. It took five years to carve and build. A statue of Hawkwing himself, a hundred times bigger than the man. They raised it here, and the city was to rise around it. There was never any city here, Egwene scoffed. There would have to be something left if there was, something. Elias nodded, still keeping his watch. 
Indeed, there was not. Arthur Hawkwing died the very day the statue was finished, and his sons and the rest of his blood fought over who would sit on Hawkwing's throne. The statue stood alone in the midst of these hills. The sons and the nephews and the cousins died, and the last of the Hawkwing's blood vanished from the earth, except maybe for some of those who went over the Arith Ocean. There were those who would have erased even the memory of him if they could. Books were burned just because they mentioned his name. In the end, there was nothing left of him but the stories, and most of them wrong. That's what his glory came to. The fighting didn't stop, of course, just because the Hawkwing and his kin were dead. There was still a throne to be won, and every lord and lady who could muster fighting men wanted it. It was the beginning of the War of the Hundred Years. Lasted 123, really, and most of the history of that time is lost in the smoke of burning towns. Many got a part of the land, but none got the whole. And sometime during those years, the statue was pulled down. Maybe they couldn't stand measuring themselves against it any longer. First you sound as if you despise him, Egwene said, and now you sound as if you admire him. She shook her head. Elias turned to look at her, a flat, unblinking stare. Get some more tea now, if you want any. I want the fire out before dark. Perrin could make out the eye clearly now, despite the failing light. It was bigger than a man's head, and the shadows falling across it made it seem like a raven's eye. 